Well, I'm here in Hungary and I'm in an abandoned Soviet military base, which is kind of insane and kind of a fitting place to commit some thought crimes, which uh, seems to be what I've been doing recently. Now, look, <laughs> I want to first say that anyone who's uh, committing violent disorder, getting aggressive with the police, uh, burning things to the ground, burning cars, burning buildings, stealing four pairs of Crocs, uh, smash and grabbing your local Greggs for some free sausage rolls whilst your face is on full display and everyone stood around you with their phones out. I mean, you are a moron. You are an idiot. Uh, most of you won't see this now because you're in custody. Okay, that, that is next level stupidity. It's, you know, it can't be justified, uh, but also on a personal level, it is personally very, very stupid. So I just want you to think about that if you're not in jail yet. Um, and I just want to preface my entire discussion by saying that you really are a bit of a silly sausage, aren't you? So what then are these protests and inevitably riots really about? I think they're very obviously about immigration. I mean, if you look over the past decades and find me a single party manifesto that's won a significant vote share, right? Not one of them will say, we'll increase immigration. Okay, not one of them will. Look at poll after poll, not just in the UK, but in all of Western Europe. And here, all of the inhabitants want lower immigration. So when that's completely ignored, and David Cameron makes a promise that immigration will decline to the tens of thousands under a conservative government, and all of a sudden it's at just under 800,000 net migration in one year, of course people are gonna feel aggrieved. You know, that's inevitable. And actually, to really process that 800,000 number, 550,000 people live in Manchester. So every year now, we need to build a city the size of Manchester, well, Manchester and a half, to accommodate for all the new people that have arrived. It's completely unfeasible. So what happens? What's the inevitable end result? Well, a huge NHS waiting list, of course. Uh, huge increases to people's housing prices, the cost of living, it's just supply versus demand. All of that is inevitable when you have massive spikes in the population. I mean, that's, that's just what happens. So our way of life has declined massively because of this. And that's what people are feeling aggrieved about, really, I think, anyway. And I think, you know, I would say there's some real justification. I think a lot of people who have time after time after time expressed their will, I mean, Brexit was probably an expression of this will, to have lower immigration, have just been betrayed constantly. So the political means of voting haven't worked. So people took to protest. Now, of course, the protests were prima facie, they were about the Southport uh, incident, but I think it's, there's a deeper seated, what Nietzsche would call resentment, um, but just resentment really about people's votes just going nowhere. Uh, to put that into perspective, the Reform Party, five million votes, five MPs. The Tory party, I think, seven million votes maybe, 150 MPs. The Labour Party, I'm sort of taking a bit of a guess here, 10 million votes maybe, um, and they completely control the government and, and everything, they've got a massive majority. So, you know, there's a real reason and feeling that people have been betrayed, particularly on the immigration issue. And that's why the protests are absolutely inevitable. So what happens when the protests turn to riots? Well, you just give the government the perfect opportunity to, instead of listening to your concerns, you know, the protests were building and building and eventually you could have got to a million man march. Very, very hard to ignore. But now, because things have turned violent uh, and there's been clashes with the police and things have been burned down and... Um, asylum hotels, asylum seeker hotels have been targeted, you are all now branded far-right thugs. And that's a massive step back for anyone who's a concerned citizen who wants lower immigration. I mean, that it has, it, objectively, it hasn't helped uh, and it will not help to keep rioting. Now, the British public have effectively been gaslit into thinking this is an NHS funding problem or a house building problem, but it, it just doesn't seem right. <laughs> it just doesn't seem right. If you bring... Uh, one and a half Manchesters to the UK every year. Of course, 
we can't build enough houses to accommodate that in time. Of course we can't. Um, you know, the NHS waiting lists, of course they're going to increase. And yes, there are immigrant doctors and nurses who do fantastic work in the NHS. Please don't think I'm denying that. But there are a few things to consider. First of all, malpractice cases uh, for foreign trained doctors, okay? Much higher than homegrown doctors. It's just a, an observable fact and you can go and look that up. I saw an article recently that um, we'd taken hundreds of Nigerian nurses who'd faked their um, certificates. They didn't have the right certificates. So what did we do? We didn't send them back to Nigeria. We just trained them in the UK, paid for it, trained them, uh, and then they were qualified, but they'd faked their certificates. So <laughs> um, it's such a bizarre situation that we've managed to get ourselves in. It's really, really strange, really strange. So why do I think the protests and the riots were kind of inevitable, right? <laughs> It's because we've set a really dangerous precedent in the UK, which is almost one of mob rule, right? Where if the protest or the riot is large enough, it will have a political impact because the police cannot police it appropriately or they're unwilling to. I don't know. Um, but look, think about it. We had the BLM riots and what happened? Keir Starmer took the knee, okay? Uh, we had the... Uh, Hare Hill riots in Leeds recently. Yes, there were, I think last I checked, 27 arrests. So people were arrested over those riots. Um, but I think the children were returned to their family. If I'm wrong in that, then uh, I will correct it in some text here. Um, and then, also, well, another one, the pro-Palestine marches, right? They were huge. And the police cannot possibly police that. They can't police, you know, three, four, five, six hundred thousand people marching through London. It's an impossible task, right? So what happens? Well, it has a political impact. All of a sudden, the government starts putting pressure. David Cameron is the foreign secretary, starts putting pressure on Israel, particularly over going into Rafa. Uh, and um, there's discussion in the House of Lords, but maybe we should be taking Palestinian uh, refugees into the UK. Okay, I don't want to get into those topics, but my point is those protests and those uh, riots had a political impact and that's the message that we've kind of sent to people now i think nowadays you look at the pro-palestine marches and they seem to be completely peaceful and they should absolutely be allowed to have those peaceful protests a hundred percent it's a democracy <laughs> they should be allowed to have those peaceful protests but at the start they weren't they really weren't they were very very violent uh, lots of clashes with the police uh, and and so on and there's another topic as well that people discuss a lot which is two-tier policing now the frontline police obviously have a very, very difficult job to do. I think everyone can see that and can understand that. And really, they follow direction from their superiors and they uh, try as best as they can, particularly in these difficult situations of like protest and riot, um, to cause, in all cases, the least disruption and the least harm. I truly believe that. And I think that's where we've got ourselves into a bad situation is that the police force are understaffed. Um, so sometimes letting... Uh, you know, a large group of rioters um, just trying to keep them in one place and let them do their rioting and pick up the damage afterwards is probably the best approach rather than having some kind of big standoff between the police and the rioters. Okay, so I understand that. But look, when it comes down to it, um, I think we haven't seen the same level of, uh, you know, 24-hour courts uh, the judiciary charging people and people are already in prison for these riots that happened a couple of days ago, you know. Uh, Keir Starmer has set up a, uh, what he calls like a specialist force for dealing with uh, disorder. There's specialist police officers now trawling through Twitter, social media, probably YouTube, and someone's probably going to watch this video uh, and make a decision as to whether I get arrested or not for having a political opinion. We didn't see that with... Um, like the pro-Palestine marches, even though we had people wave, waving sort of um, flags from prescribed organisations around and calling for jihad on the streets of the UK, you know, quite, quite bizarre and dangerous activities, right? We're not pleased in this really heavy-handed way um, as is happening now. So I, you can see why people are starting to think about this two-tier police system. Very unfortunate for Keir Starmer, by the way. I can't think of any other male name that rhymes with tier other than Keir. So he has, of course, become two-tier Keir. Very, very unfortunate. And in reality, he's only been in office for a month. The root cause of this problem is not Keir Starmer's fault, okay? 
you may think he's making it worse, you may think he's dealing with it appallingly, but this is not his fault. Um, the Conservative Party have been in power for 13 years. So there we go. And it, as well, you can take individual cases and you can look at them and it really gives you food for thought. So um, you may remember there was a news story about a chap called Gabriel Abdullah who uh, took a long knife and went to a kosher supermarket uh, in London. Uh, and he was threatening uh, obviously Jewish people and asking them what their views were on the Israel-Gaza conflict whilst brandishing a huge knife. Now, of course, he was arrested and he was charged uh, and he was taken through the court system and he was given a suspended sentence for brandishing a knife outside a kosher uh, supermarket, I believe, asking people what their views were on a political matter. Suspended sentence, no jail time. Contrast that to, uh, I think his name is Stephen Malin, right? He is one of the idiots who was uh, rioting violently, okay? He was arrested uh, and charged for uh, gesticulating towards the police uh, and shouting at them repeatedly. So presumably, you know, he gave them the finger and he told them to fuck off, right? A lot, okay? Pretty awful behavior, pretty disgusting behavior. Nobody thinks that that behavior is acceptable or okay. Nobody's justifying that behavior. 26 months in prison, to over two years of his life taken away um, for that. Whereas Gabriel Abdullah, who genuinely terrified Jewish people until he was tackled, okay, because they were thinking this man is going to kill one of us or he's going to try to, genuinely terrified people, no jail time. Now, of course, it's impossible to um, know all of the ins and outs of like, uh, previous criminal history for all I know Steve Malin is a bit of a bad guy uh, and he's got you know lots of history and, uh, and whatever else okay fine maybe for you know I was going to say maybe he was shouting racist things but I presume he wasn't because uh, then he would have been tried for that so you know we can't judge the ins and outs of every individual court case but you can see how people are starting to have this perception built up of a two-tier justice system and I think I think everyone knows that that is true. Maybe not everyone, but I think uh, you know most people are kind of conscious of that now. Um, and it, hopefully, because people are conscious of it, it, it will change. Although, <laughs> clearly, the approach at the moment has been to very heavy-handedly clamp down on the protests with some pretty severe um, penalties. And even the judges in the cases are saying, you know... Uh, the reason that you're getting this sentence, this long of a sentence, is in the wider context of civil unrest that's happening at the moment. It's clearly being used as a massive deterrent. But I think that's uh, unfair to the individual who's being tried. I think that is unfair to Steve Malin um, for committing an offence that, in other circumstances, he probably wouldn't be going to jail for. But now he's lost two years of his life. So make of that what you will. You can be angry about it. I see that as probably... Another good reason to those who are considering rioting or being aggressive towards the police that it's not worth it. Like, it's really not worth it. Um, you are probably going to be throwing your, your life down the drain um, if you've got a good career um, or whatever else. You know, why throw it away? You know, two years in prison. <sighs> another curiosity or another strange thing that's happening is newspapers that have for years, decades maybe, fanned the flames of, of this sentiment. I'm talking about the Daily Mail and the Sun. Have today all banded together to uh, call everyone far-right thugs. Um, and it's so bizarre. I mean, the Daily Mail uh, just a few years ago were posting articles about demographic change in the UK, about how um, White Brits are going to be, uh, white British children are going to be a minority in uh, 30 years time or whatever. And today they're starting to publish articles about um, the myth of the great replacement. OK, I'm not saying there's I'm not saying there's a great replacement theory, but, um, you know, it just strikes me as interesting how you've now got the state, the police and the media all combining to just quell any political dissent. And I think the reason is because they recognize, these aren't stupid people, they recognize that there are a lot of British people who are very, very frustrated. And the best way that they can control them is threaten them with enormous, like incommensurate to similar crimes elsewhere, jail sentences, right? Um, 
brandish them with nasty names like racist and far right and so on. Um, and really, they're pulling out all of the stops to prevent those people who are concerned about the levels of immigration, both legal and illegal, um, into this country. It's really stamped down on that. Uh, and it's, it's quite scary. I mean, like I mentioned before, you know, you've now got a dedicated police force looking at social media posts online. And people around the world are kind of, I think they're kind of laughing at us a little bit. They're not laughing. They're probably crying um, because it's so bizarre to see. We now have people going to jail for 12, me 12 weeks, forgive me, for posting misinformation online. So as we revealed live yesterday, a 55-year-old Cheshire mum remains in police custody after 24 hours for sending a, quote, inaccurate post on X on the day of the Southport massacre. Now, she caveated her post with the words, if this is true. She deleted it after two hours and she then apologised. Now, yeah, you shouldn't be posting misinformation online. 12 weeks in jail, you lose your job. Um, therefore, perhaps you lose your uh, mortgage on your house. All of that seems like a kind of really dystopian uh, what we would think of as like the Chinese social credit system being introduced. You know, you posted the wrong thing online, you're not protected by free speech, and uh, you're, you're going to jail and you're losing everything. Okay, because nobody owns anything anymore. Everything's leased. You know, you've got a mortgage, your car is on uh, finance, everything else. So if you lose your job, even for a few months, you're in a really tough place. You're in a really bad place. You lose everything. Um, Really, really scary, really scary. Now, obviously, people who are posting like overtly racist things online, yeah, that's terrible. That is obviously, that's not acceptable. I understand that. Um, but I think we need to take a very close look at some of these cases, particularly for social media uh, and, and the sort of misinformation posts and things like that, uh, and, and see, well, <laughs> see whether the crime befits the, uh, well, see if it is a crime and then see if the crime befits the punishment. Uh, I think it's just, we've got to be very, very careful here because a lot of people are using hyperbole and saying, you know, the UK's like a Soviet state now. Uh, it's not, that's, that's ludicrous, but it, it is really scary. And it's the biggest sort of infringement of civil liberties and rights that I've seen for a very, very long time. So it scares me a little bit as a Brit, you know, and I am a proud Brit. This country has given me uh, so many opportunities, okay? It gave me the opportunity to study at one of the best universities in the world. Uh, I served my country in the British Army for eight years, you know, very proud to have done so. And it's those, it's that sense of patriotism which makes me now want to put my head above the parapet, knowing that you know, my whole family are going to see this video uh, and make these points and just express these views because I, I think it's the truth and I think that's the underlying sentiment and I think that's what's happening. Um, you know, I'm not inciting any riots or any reckless or damaging behavior, but I am very, very concerned about some of the things that I see happening in the UK. So what's the end result of all of this? The end result to me is very, very obvious. It's that Tommy Robinson, you know, one of the most divisive figures uh, in the country, uh, is, is almost certainly going to be put in jail for a very, very long time. Um, and why is that? I mean, Tommy Robinson, I followed him initially as a curiosity in the same way that I follow a lot of people that I don't like and that I don't agree with. Um, you know, I follow Andrew Tate. I don't like him. Oh, yeah, it's like a morbid curiosity. I think the bloke is basically a pimp. Um, I don't know why people idolize him. Uh, you know, he's probably right about some small things, but in general, I don't like him, but I follow him anyway. So I started following Tommy Robinson. And what I very quickly realized is that he is not the figure that the media makes him out to be. Yeah, he's a working class lad and he's got a bit of a history, which he will, he will tell you. But actually, you know, I don't think he's racist at all. I don't think Tommy Robinson is at all racist. He started the Black White Unite movement. OK, um, I, you know, Tommy Robinson, when uh, a Muslim man was accused uh, of a crime that he didn't commit, he went to investigate it and he became very quickly convinced that this man was innocent. And uh, Tommy Robinson, you know, that didn't fit his, you know, narrative around grooming gangs and everything else. 
for which, by the way, his work is excellent. And ultimately, he was talking about those crimes, those horrific crimes, long, long, long before the media uh, and the police caught on to it. But he went to interview this Muslim man, realized that this guy's innocent. This guy's almost certainly innocent. Um, and he put his neck out on the line to ensure that uh, that guy, that people knew that that guy was innocent, right? I don't think this guy's innocent. Uh, I don't think this guy's uh, a racist or anything like that. I really, really don't. Um, but he's somehow in the media now been set up as the cause of all of these riots. And that's ludicrous. That is absolutely ludicrous. I looked at uh, his recent videos, okay, and every protest that Tommy Robinson has put on, he's always appealed for calm. He's always said, you know, I don't want there to be, you know, anything kicking off or anything like that. Um, in the videos that he has recently put up since the riots broke out, frequently begging people not to, not to you know, cause riotous behaviour, to burn things down or anything else like that. And a lot of this is being instigated online. And probably the most influential instigator for all is Tommy Robinson. Directing the violence. Uh, and but you're referring to some of the images on the front page of Tommy lies. Robinson. Tommy Robinson. He hates Europe. I know there's a protest night in London. Lads, you've got to remain calm. Just an appeal for calm, man. Anyone going to London tonight? There's protest outside down the street, outside Parliament for Prime Minister's questions, I believe. Try and uh, bring the numbers, bring the noise, but don't bring any violence, man. Our country is in the gutter. Um, we ain't gonna win it back by throwing a few rocks at coppers. I'm frustrated, I'm angry, but to go out and burn a police building in a block of buildings with multiple occupancies is absolutely fucking ridiculous. Yeah? Insane, really. And yeah, the level of violence, it won't work, okay? It will just give them the excuse not to listen to the wider public's general concerns and fears on all these issues. We're on the verge of something massive where we've won the hearts and minds of the public. Don't undo that, yeah? We had 100,000 people on the streets of London in a peaceful resistance. That 100,000 will become 250,000. 250 will become half a million. A peaceful revolution is brewing in Great Britain. A peaceful re revolution. But I think it's uh, all of the facts aren't going to save him because the media has already decided that he is the sole cause of all of this riotous behaviour. Despite very obvious empirical evidence to the contrary. But I think they will go after him and I think they will crucify him, which is very unfortunate because uh, I think he is ultimately, you know, a bit of a scapegoat in, in that front. Uh, and that, I can't believe I'm saying this with what I used to think about Tommy Robinson, but um, that makes me very sad. That makes me, you know, kind of upset to be quite frank. Um, I don't think this guy is a bad guy. I think he's uh, very critical of Islam. I think it's his uh, right to be critical of Islam in the same way that uh, if someone was critical of Christianity, uh, then that's, uh, that's okay. Because I believe in free speech, I believe in free thought, uh, and he should be able to do that. Another thing that fascinates me about Tommy Robinson being like the most derided man in the UK, although he's not, some people love him, of course. In fact, I think uh, his rehabilitation, the rehabilitation of him since Elon Musk allowed him back on Twitter has been enormous. Um, but, you know, what strikes me as really bizarre is that his views are basically the same as Christopher Hitchens before he died. You know, nobody, uh, nobody was so, like, violently hateful towards Christopher Hitchens. His views are the same as Douglas Murray, you know, a very well-spoken, very well-educated, very well-spoken uh, man who writes books about um, what he describes as the Islamic invasion of Europe and the death of Europe, right? So really similar views. Douglas Murray speaks very well. He's clearly very, very intelligent. Uh, he debates very well. He's clearly very intelligent. Um, and basically, I think there's a sort of classism there where if Tommy Robinson has these views, the same views, and I don't think Tommy Robinson's a stupid guy. I think he's a very clever guy, actually. Uh, but when Tommy Robinson has these views, because he's a working class lad with a bit of an accent, you know, that's not okay. Whereas if Douglas Murray has it with a posh accent, 
you know, they, the same people would still criticize Douglas Murray for their views, but not with the same vociferous hatred, you know? Um, and I, th I really do believe that that's a kind of classism uh, in effect. That's all that's happening there. And, you know, it's quite scary for me to think about what happens if my intuition is correct and Tommy Robinson is effectively made the fall guy um, for all of this and goes to jail for a very long time because I think a lot of people will see that as a massive injustice, right? And what happens to England then? I don't know. I honestly don't know. People will... We'll see. It's, a, it's pretty scary. For me, it's pretty scary um, thinking about that. It really is. I'm not a defund the police kind of guy. I'm a fund the police kind of guy. Very recently, we had... Um, we had uh, like making loads of experienced police officers redundant, paying them redundancy. And then very quickly it was realized that actually we need more police officers, so we just hired new ones. But now you've lost all of the experience from those experienced police officers and you've got like a fresh-faced force, okay? Very strange, very bizarre. Um, and the police need more resources to deal with these kinds of things. And, it, it, you know, I've traveled through Serbia, Bosnia, uh, Hungary now. <laughs> this is anecdotal. I don't know if this is true. But I see police everywhere. I see police everywhere. Every small town. When I was uh, in Vlasnica, in Bosnia, in Republika Srpska, um, there were like four, four police cars uh, parked up at one point next to each other. There's police everywhere. Uh, and so I think the ratio of like police to people in other countries must be higher. <laughs> it might not be. Maybe it's just perception. I don't know. Um, but I can't drive through Hungary um, speeding. Not that I would. Not that I would ever do that. Um, because every few kilometers there's a police car with a speed speed gun on top of it you know um, so i think i think the police need more funding they need to be able to actually police without fear or favor and i feel like they can't do that at the moment and the reason that they can't do that at the moment is because they know that if they upset certain uh communities within the uk um, then there'll be massive civil unrest that they simply cannot police or that they cannot deal with so you know, the recent example of uh, Child Protective Services took away uh, some children from a Romanian family in Leeds, okay, with allegations of neglect. I don't really know the ins and outs of the case. don't know if it was true or not. But when that happened, there was absolute uproar in Leeds. Leeds started burning to the ground, you know. Uh And the police find that very, very difficult to deal with then at that point. That's a real problem. So I, I feel like the police can't police without fear or favour, without correct funding. And I'm, I am broadly sympathetic to that. I don't think the correct reaction is to start policing the symptom rather than trying to look for political solutions to the cause. Very interestingly, uh, one uh, police and crime commissioner wrote a letter saying these people who are protesting and rioting, you know, the... They would call themselves the native Brits or whatever, the concerned citizens, however you want to know, or the far-right thugs, if you like. You know, those people uh, have legitimate concerns around immigration, and that needs to be addressed politically. Um, and, you know, some people were very on board for that message, some people were not. Um, she'll probably lose her job for it, um, <laughs> but there you go. I thought it was very, very interesting to hear a police and crime commissioner saying that, frankly, um, because I think that's what a lot of people are thinking. And also, to me, it seems like the right approach is to listen to people and have their uh, concerns voiced and heard. You know, they voted for lower immigration anyway, year on year on year. You know, what, how about we start listening to these people, engaging in a dialogue with them, uh, and, you know, we can solve some of the situations that way. Hey, check this out. You can see where there's doggy paw print. So presumably, I don't know, 50 years ago when this was built, some little Soviet doggy was walking through these concrete slabs as they were being laid down, probably having some equally Soviet builders furious. Uh, now the poor prince is still there. The dog is probably long gone, but the poor prince is still there. So um, it's left its mark in this world. Very cool. On a completely 
unrelated note, this place is kind of mental. <laughs> um, you know what this gives me uh, the vibes of? It gives me like Pripyat vibes, you know? You ever played Call of Duty? Um, 50,000 people used to live here. Now it's a ghost town. <laughs> That's the vibes it gives me. Um, feels very, very sort of, well, I was going to say it feels very Soviet. And of course it does, because like I said, it's a Soviet military base. I'm trying to get a thumbnail look. <laughs> Fucking hell. Oh. Maybe we'll just take a little look in one of these buildings. Oh, there's a bit of roof that's collapsed. Kind of, kind of nuts, isn't it, this place? I think this used to be a Soviet military base for a helicopter regiment. That's my understanding anyway. And now I guess teens just come here and graffiti it at night. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, what's this? No. Ah, I thought this was like some kind of original document, but I don't think it is. Because uh, it says army gang on it at the bottom. <laughs> um, I guess this is like a map, like a layout. Maybe they do proper tours of this place that you can uh, pay for and come and have a look at. And I guess, look, you see at the bottom 11 headquarters or whatever that is. Uh, I should know more. I should do my research before I come to a place like this rather than just coming. Um, but hey. Yeah, this place is in tatters. Still, I love coming to places like this. I really do. If you want to see me climbing, going into something that's truly, truly sketchy, um, go and have a look at my sort of Bosnia video, uh, climbing that observatory, sort of sniper's nest observatory. Uh, yeah, that's probably the scariest thing I've climbed. Uh, that thing was definitely going to collapse at some point, um, probably in the very near future. But hey, we got away with it. We're alive. Uh, we're here. So, yeah. I suppose truly the last thing I will say is to anyone who uh, wants to call me racist because I think people have legitimate concerns around immigration and because I think, you know, people have voted for lower immigration for decades and their will is simply not being enacted. Um, you know, I really believe we should be treating the cause and not the symptom. Uh, we're, just, we're just getting this so wrong. Um, for anyone who thinks that I'm racist or wants to call me racist, you go ahead, you play the name calling game. I worked for eight years in what I believe truly is the most diverse organization in the UK, which is the British Army. Okay, so we have my Sergeant Major, big Fijian guy, love the bloke, hilarious. My Staff Sergeant, BQMS, saved my life numerous times, not literally, um, from Malawi, okay? The chefs who, whenever I was plan planning functions or events, they really would save my life. Um, those guys uh, from the Caribbean, uh, or Nepal, Nepalese, um, Gurkha soldiers. So you go ahead, play the name calling game. It's water off a duck's back because anyone who knows me knows I'm not a racist, knows that I'm not inciting riots. I just have a political opinion. And when I see what I am seeing in the UK, which is this sort of like multifaceted uh, approach to trying to quell people having political opinions, that is precisely what has made me voice my political opinions. You know, I spent uh, eight years of my life, like I say, not voicing any political opinion because when you're in the army, especially as an officer, you shouldn't be voicing any political opinion, right? I understand that, completely understand that. Um, <laughs> but when, when the liberties and the rights for people to express their opinion seem to me like they're being degraded and taken away, um, for me, that's kind, of the, that's kind of the final straw. And that's where I'll make my political opinion heard. I don't know how many people will hear it or see it. Um, maybe a couple hundred, uh, which would be cool. Um, but uh, yeah, got it off my chest, didn't I, I suppose, right. Hey, check this out. Some kind of ancient bus. Let's go and take a look. This video is like a mix of super serious and super not serious. <laughs> it's cool though. This place is cool. Wow. Hammer and sickle. Interesting. Really interesting. I'm very, very glad I came here. It really is a fitting place to... Uh, to do a video like this. Oh, do you know what? That hammer and sickle is just 
such, such a good thumbnail opportunity, isn't it? Right. Thumbnail unlocked. And yeah, that's it. That's, that's the end of the video. <laughs> Sorry, I made you watch that. The UK's fucked up and there's no one coming over to save me Elon Musk is trying to beat with Kia Star Wars crazy All that we want is our borders closed But all that we got is you Edwards and closed If I speak my mind, then I am far right I guess I better pop my bags cause I'm fucking not over the Poland Where the streets are safe and you're not here to lock me up in jail Over a comment I put on Facebook I guess I kinda like the way you push me away We're patriotic but one thing is that we are not racist I try and see a doctor, but my time is just wasted. I'm not being funny, but where are the kids? No women in sight, just bad on those ships. Stop giving them money and sort out our shit. I guess you'd rather make more friends like Jimmy and Phil over in Poland. They keep their streets safe, and you're not here. To lock me up in jail over some comments I left on Facebook. I guess I kinda like the way you push me away.